Um, so I am very excited to have uh, Heather with us. Um, she has been working on her campaign already for a few months, um, but we uh, started getting more visible. You may have seen, heard people knocking on your door or leaving um, literature there. Um, so uh, she is running for state representative. So if you live in Waltham, your representative in the state legislature's House of Representatives is either Tom Stanley, um, who represents most of Waltham, and he used to represent part of, he used to represent Lincoln, but with redistricting, he just represents Waltham. As you know, he's also a city councilor. Um, and Heather is challenging him for his seat. They're both Democrats, so she'll be challenging him in the Democratic primary, which is on um, September 6th. So in order to vote in that, you either need to be a, a registered as a Democrat or unenrolled. The way it works in Massachusetts is if you're enrolled as a party, you can't vote in someone else's primary, but if you're unenrolled, you can vote in whatever primary you want. But you do need to be registered, and the de deadline to register to, to vote in the primary is August 27th. And of course, there is no Republican candidate, so whoever wins the primary will get the seat unless something very unusual happens, but still show up to vote in November too, because there'll be other important things on the ballot. The other thing, exciting thing to know about Heather is that she helped out uh, with Councillor Bradley MacArthur's campaign last year. And um, as you know, uh, Representative Stanley is very established. He's been in the legislature for about 20 years. He's the son of a former mayor of Waltham and he's been on the Waltham City Council for a long time too. Um, so he's a very established candidate, but we saw Councillor Bradley MacArthur be a very established candidate last year. So we think this is going to be an exciting uh, race to watch. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, I want to find out just the basics on, you know, who you are and why you're running, but I want to start with a little bit harder question first, if that's okay. So sure. before you started your campaign, you were the head of Waltham Democrats, and you're running as a Democrat. Um, I think a lot of our audience members are on the left of the political spectrum with some very notable exceptions, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're Democrats or they're excited about voting Democrat right now. So what does being a Democrat mean to you and why should anyone be excited about voting Democrat right now? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think in when we look sort of federally um, and, and we look at what's going on with Democrats uh, at the national level, um, I mean, the answer to what's going on is not much. Right. Um, and I think that's a lot of the frustration that a lot of us Democrats feel um, at, at the national level is that we're just we're not doing enough. We're, um, you know, not standing up and fighting for the things that we believe in um, in a way that feels, um, you know, strong enough for most of us. And I think that for me, that also translates into the state um, Democrats, and it translates into this particular race. Uh, I think that, um, you know, as you said, Tom Stanley has been around for a long time. Um, he knows a lot of people, um, but I don't think that we've seen him do enough for the ninth Middlesex over the last 20, 22 years. Um, and I think the people of Waltham deserve more. Uh, I think they need someone to fight for them. You know, we are dealing with um, all of the things <laughs> all of the time, right? Uh, housing affordability, climate change, um, transportation, policing, you know, all of those things are on our plates. And I don't see my rep doing the job that I want being done for me. I don't see my voice and the voices of people in my community being amplified for. So to me, being a Democrat um, means that you are fighting for a better world for everyone. That That's my very simple definition of being a Democrat. Um, you know, I love uh, 
uh, Julia Meha, the uh, Boston City Councilor, who always says, you know, all means all. And um, I think that we have a lot of Democrats in Massachusetts who are looking out for number one, which is them, um, and not looking out for the rest of us. And so that's, you know, brought me into the race. And um, that's what being a Democrat means to me, is really just fighting for other people. You said that that applies, what you're saying applies to this race and that you're, you're not, um, you don't think people are getting what they want. Um, from Representative Stanley. What are some of the specific issues there? Yeah, so there's a lot of things, you know, we've been out on the doors since uh, February, and some of the things that I'm hearing a lot are um, things like we need um, to improve, you know, our, our transportation infrastructure. Um, people are frustrated that public transportation you know, in Waltham, it's it's just not very feasible, especially for families, for people who work, you know, maybe um, in closer to Boston to get back and forth in any kind of um, reliable way, right? Um, also, you know, things like housing affordability. Um, I've talked to a lot of people um, from young families just moving in to uh, you know, seniors who have lived here their entire lives, who are really concerned about how much money they're having to spend on rent or on mortgage payments because it's not sustainable. Um, I think the one thing that people really uh, are upset about, and we talk about a lot on the doors, is the issues that we have with transparency or the lack of transparency at the state house. Um, you know, when we talk about the difference between Democrats, um, transparency is, is really number one for me. Tom Stanley has voted against every single <clears throat> transparency measure that has come uh, before him, you know, and that means he's voted no on making his committee votes public. Um, he's voted no on, um, you know, uh, standing for roll call votes at a lower threshold than what it is right now. Um, he's uh, voted no on having, uh, I think, 48 hours to review bills. Um, and I just recently was, you know, reading through the, the climate change bill, and I was like, I, you really need 48 hours before you decide to, <laughs> to hit a yes or no button on this. Um, and uh, he voted no on, on 30 minutes to look at amendments before you vote on them. Um, so what that says to me is that the governing is not happening in on the state house floor, right? It's happening in the back room. It's happening way before the bill comes out. It's happening in committee behind closed doors with no transparency around votes that are taken, et cetera. Um, and to me, as a Democrat, that is antithetical to democracy. Um, and that really resonates with our voters. Um, and they're very upset uh, that that is what is taking place at their state house. And they want a state representative who believes in a transparent government. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the legislature or, um, is resistant to changing those seeming failures of uh, transparency? So I think some of the things that you hear people talk about um, are these kind of um, excuses like, well, being able to vote in secret gives committees more power. Um, well, to me, that says they're already aware of the fact that they have a speaker who has entirely too much power. So they, they're right in their answer there, it's saying there's an imbalance of power um, that we can't govern around. Um, I also think that it, that's just a bad answer because um, you are elected to be a representative of the people, right? Um, and that means the people have to know 
whether you're representing them or not. And so if you, you know, if I don't know how you voted in committee, I don't know if you really fought for my bill or not, right? Um, and that is, is just infinitely frustrating, I think, to a lot of us who have been advocating for more progressive policy positions over the years and just seen them, you know, just sit in the house and wither away and die. Can you yeah. give us an example of an idea that was seemed like it had momentum in the legislature and then didn't end up working out? Well, I mean, there are lots of, you know, I think um, the fair share amendment basically uh, in some form or another has been around for at least a decade. Um, and, and I think almost two. Uh, and it just, you know, just kept going nowhere and going nowhere and going nowhere until we have finally got a, a couple of, uh, you know, more progressive um, reps and we have um, some amazing advocacy groups uh, who have organized around it and we get to vote on it in November, you know, and so finally, um, hopefully, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get our, our, fair share amendment passed, um, but it's taken decades. Let me ask you uh, about another thing to, that came to mind when you were talking about things that sort of got going in the legislature. In 2020, the legislature was discussing police reform, and there was a bill that would have um, eliminated qualified immunity. Um, Tom Stanley voted against that. There was then a, a negotiation with um, the police organizations and that bill was significantly revised um, to be more acceptable to them. Um, Tom Stanley still voted against it, but it passed. And since then, we haven't really heard anyone at the state level or here in Waltham talking about police reform. Um, do you want to say anything about police reform? Um, I think that it's... Um shameful that we have a state rep that couldn't even bring himself to vote for what I consider a fairly watered down police reform bill. Um, you know, so I think in my conversations with uh, police from Waltham uh, in, you know, Boston, I, I work in Boston, um, that they want to feel safe as well. Um, and I think that's why you saw some of the um, the compromises that were were made uh, because they, you know, there's an understanding that that something has to change, that the way that we police in the United States has to change. Um, but Tom Stanley decided that, you know, he was going to join a very small group of Republicans to vote against that final bill. Um, I think we haven't heard a lot about it since then, um, perhaps because the bill passed and then we're in an election year. So uh, waiting for people to get into, you know, their um, elected positions and then see what happens with it. Um, so and you do think it could come back up? Um in the next session of the legislature. Yeah, because I think, you know, uh, passing a bill is really hard in the Massachusetts State House, but um, implementing a bill like a police reform bill is also incredibly difficult. And the fight does not stop when you have the votes, right? It, it continues. You have to get, you know, funding. You have to have some sort of... Um, checks and balances, you have to have ways of implementing trainings, you know, all of those things. Um, and that is still going to have to be um, advocated for. Thank you. Okay, so I've got the tough, now that I've given you some tough questions. Now, <laughs> do you want to just tell us a little more about who, who Heather May is and, and how you ended up in Waltham and why you're running for office? Sure. Um, well, let's see, I'm originally from Nebraska. Um, and I moved out here to go to graduate school um, many years ago, uh, 97. <laughs> and, um, you know, I 
growing up in Nebraska, I, I grew up with a lot of people that seemed very at home with contradictions to me, um, <laughs> where they were very, you know, it's a, a very sort of community oriented people who will do anything for each other. Um, you know, I can remember um, at, when I was younger, I, I think I was like middle school, we were reshingling the roof of our church. And um, there was like, you know, some of us kids out, we were playing, we weren't shingling, um, <laughs> but our, our fathers and, and mothers were, and a group of guys drove by who had roofers, they had just gotten off work um, and they just pulled in and started helping. And that's the kind of people that I grew up with is you just roll up your sleeves and you get to work. During that time, what I also saw was um, my dad and uh, my his dad, my, my grandpa Erickson, um, both worked in sort of the healthcare field. Um, my grandfather worked, he was uh, president of the Rural Hospitals Association for um, many years. And he worked really hard to get the accessibility to basic healthcare, like hospitals, into rural areas. My dad uh, kind of followed in his footsteps, and um, you know, I, my dad and I used to meet, and we would have conversations uh, before he was headed to Washington to go <laughs> talk to his uh, his senators, and um, you know, seeing him do that even though I know he hates to talk in front of people, and, um, but it was important. And he was speaking for people who, for whatever reason, did not have the voice to make those things happen on their own. When I got to Waltham, we moved here in uh, 2014. Um, you know, this community felt very much like home. It was a roll up your sleeves, let's get it done kind of community. And I just love uh, that about Waltham. There are a lot of growing pains right now for kind of becoming um, the kinds of cities that America needs. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of people being left out of those conversations. And that's why I'm running is because I want to be able to bring those voices in to amplify them when I'm the one that has to be in the room, but also to work really hard to bring their voices into the room because um, people can advocate for themselves um, when they have the chance to do so. Uh, but our state house does everything it possibly can to keep them on the outside. And I just think that's wrong. Thank you. Um, I saw you a few weeks ago when we, the news was leaked about, well, more than a few weeks ago now when the news was leaked that Roe v. Wade was about to be overturned, there was a flash protest in Waltham, and I saw you there, and um, that is a national issue, but we've talked on our show about how it can also be a state issue and a local issue. Um, what would you do in the legislature in the area of reproductive rights and, and gender justice? So I think, you know, so far, um, we've, we've responded well, I think, in Massachusetts. Um, we have put together, you know, the Beyond Row um, Coalition and um, a series of um, legislative ways in which we can keep people safe, we can keep access uh, to reproductive health care, to abortion. Um, we can make sure that um, our providers are safe um, and we can be a safe haven for people in other states that um, need access to abortion care. Um, so I think we're, we're doing a good job, um, but again, it's kind of like the police reform. This is not something that's just going to like, okay, we're cool. Um, 
<laughs> you know, let's moving on. Um, it's it's a fight that's happening, you know, on a national level and it's happening on a state level. And um, the the day that the decision came out, I was actually doing an endorsement interview with um, a group called Her Bold Move, um, which uh, works to put women into uh, you know political seats that have never had a woman, which the ninth Middlesex has never had a woman in the seat. Um, pretty sure it's never had anything but a white man <laughs> in the seat um, looking at the history. And, you know, we just, um, we came on and they were like, hi, how are you? And I said, how are you? And like, there was four of us, we, we cried for, you know, like a good five minutes. Um, Cause it's, it's very hard in 2022. And especially when you have as much privilege as I do, I'm a white, heterosexual, middle-class, cisgendered woman. Like I really couldn't have much more privilege if I tried. Um, and yet to wake up one day and go, oh, I don't have the right to make decisions about my own body. That's just, it's shocking on a variety of levels. And I think it also, you know, we've talked about in the media, it, it opens the door to other civil rights issues that we have considered settled. And um, if that happens, we need people who are going to really go the distance and fight for those things. And that's something, you know, I've been doing my whole life. There's one more thing that I know will be important to our audience and you sort of brought it up, which is the climate bill. Um, can you kind of, for those of us who haven't been following state politics closely, can you catch us up on where climate is at and, and, and also what you'd like to see happen? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> Cliff Notes version. Um, so th there are a lot of good things um, in, this, in this climate bill. Um, one thing that I think we need to talk about is the fact that um, the legislative session is over on Sunday and we are just getting the climate bill passed. That is ridiculous. Absolutely. There, there's, there's no excuse for the pace at which things move in the state house. So now what we've done is we put ourselves in a position where it's sitting with Governor Baker and something has to happen by Sunday. And if it doesn't, then you know, and, and we have a, a super majority, a democratic super majority. We, you know, there's no reason except that when you look at the climate bill, you can see that the House and the Senate, they had a long way to go before they got to somewhere where they felt comfortable with the bills that came out of their respective chambers. Um, the, the House um, seems to be very focused on um, like offshore wind, renewable energy and infrastructure and things like that, which I think is great, um, you know, and it's um, putting together, you know, new industries and new technology. And, and you know, I think that that's um, really a strength that we have here in Massachusetts is doing things like that. On the other side, the, the Senate, you know, we're really sort of uh, focused a little bit more on like transportation infrastructure, um, you know, going electric, no rebates for any, um, you know, appliances that use fossil fuel, um, you know, so that we can start transitioning, especially in new construction to um, electric. And I see uh, Tom here talking about construction. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I really think that there are a couple of things that are missing in the climate bill. And the first one is a reasonable <clears throat> timeline. And by reasonable, I mean a timeline that can affect change before we're all underwater. Um, 2050 is 
it's just ridiculous to me that we're we're looking out at 2050 when we know um, that we need to cut emissions in half in 2030. We need to cut them in half again in 2040, cut them in half again in 2050. Like we, this is a big job because we have created this problem. And so we have to fix it. And, you know, there are some of those um, societal changes where society changes first, and then we legislate. And then there are some of them where um, the legislation comes first, and then we move society, right? And I think that climate change is one of those things where we will have to legislate change because it's inconvenient for people, right? Um, and we've, we've seen everything from, you know, masks to <laughs> heat waves. Uh, people don't like to be inconvenienced. Um, and so especially big developers, um, especially, you know, big corporations, uh, they don't want anything that's going to eat into their margins. Um, we need to, developers should have a seat at the table, but they shouldn't have the whole table, right? Um, and, you know, like Governor Baker's um, climate uh, conference committee or what, I forget what they were called, but it was all real estate, uh, you know, and and developers. And these are not the people uh, who are taking climate change seriously right now. Um, the woman who's the vice president of the Massachusetts Commercial uh, Construction Organization, I'm forgetting the name, it starts with an N. Um, it, she said, you know, 2050 is just, that's too fast. <laughs> okay. Can she swim? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Let me get my snorkel out, you know, we'll talk about it some more. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, hopefully, uh, I mean, Charlie is probably going to send it back. Uh, and hopefully we do it in time to override the veto. Um, and we'll have something, you know, a good start to work with. Chris or James, did you have any questions for Heather? James? I didn't really have a question as much as a comment. And it's that, especially with the road decision, it's more and more of stuff that we would associate with like the federal government doing since become falling on the states and that's the importance of having good people in state legislature in a transparent process for things getting done in a timely manner and like yeah. you said bringing up climate change and housing these are things that need to get addressed and they're related to each other as well as transit and you can't have a comprehensive climate solution without addressing housing and transit for people simple as yeah simple as Absolutely. All of our, our buses, our public transportation needs to be electric. We, the grid has to be updated. Um, we need, you know, more solar um, and uh, we need the new construction of housing inventory to be above and beyond. Um, it can't just be business as usual or we just continue, you know, we perpetuate the problem. Yep. And also that construction has to be good for the workers. Yes, it does. Absolutely. So Heather, I feel like I feel like I should like recuse myself from this conversation because uh, <laughs> we've been friends for many years now. And also I've been knocking on doors for you during this uh, election cycle and also your last election cycle as well um, in War II. Um, but uh, I mean, the number one issue for me when it comes to elected folks in Waltham is how involved in the community are you so if you'd like to take a moment to talk about how you've been involved in the Waltham community since you've been here I think actually you and I met a, a progressive Waltham uh meeting <laughs> um and I also I I often give Chris and um Kelly Dam uh the credit for me being so involved in politics <laughs> since the pandemic and even before then things like housing and food insecurity have always been important to me. And I've been delivering food for um, Waltham Mutual Aid. Um, my favorite thing was uh, going out to the farm and picking up, you know, an entire carload full of produce. <laughs> the, the, the 
week that it had bags and bags of basil was amazing because my car smelled so good. Um, we also, you know, we have wonderful programs like um, the Waltham Partnership for Youth. I was just able to do some um, communication uh, courses for their new interns uh, because they're going into their new internships and uh, thinking about, you know, how to write emails in the workplace and how to have, you know, conflict and conversations and all of those things. And um, that was really, uh, really fun that it's a wonderful organization. Thank you very much, Heather. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thank you, Heather. So yeah, so if you uh, are happy with you, what you've heard from Heather, you can vote for her on September 6th in the Democrat primary, or you can volunteer to help with her campaign. If you're not eligible to vote because you're not 18 yet or any other reason, you can still help on campaigns and that's a good way to learn about them. I always like to mention that. Uh, so thank you very and, much, Heather, and good luck. Oh, and go don't, ahead. don't forget, September 6th is the day after Labor Day. It is the ah, day okay. after the last long weekend of the summer. It's a wonderful day to have an election. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but your vote by mail uh, applications are on their way. Um, so if you know that you're not going to be around, make sure you fill that out. Good point. Thank you. Yep.